Hello, welcome to Illustration 1, GD216. My name is Shane Latane, your instructor. Just a couple quick notes as we begin. That is the best way to get hold of me, shanel at shaw.ca. If you are curious to see some of my work, I will show you some of my work as we go, but you can always check out my personal website, reninspain.net. But most importantly, idearefinery.net is my teaching support website. Uh, let's take a quick look at it. You can see here what it looks like in its current state. I have this carousel across the top here. I will be changing this as we go through the course. Um, as you see, I updated with things like student work. Here are some of the GD101 color compositions from the summer classes that had just run. I also put uh, tutorials on here, as you can see here, ethically sourced illustrations. This is something that also has a link to a tutorial about how to create this torn paper effect in Photoshop. Also, as I scroll down here, you can see I have a couple of columns here that pertain to the current classes that I'm teaching. The first column, Classes, is where you can find your course syllabus. Next to it, under Assignments, you will find the project briefs for your current project. Let me come back to my presentation. Now, before we get into anything too specific regarding illustration, let's talk about what I'm looking for from you for this term. We are going to be doing four projects in total. The first is a black and white traditional media. That means using pen and ink and paper and uh, most of the usual art supplies that we're used to, and creating a set of four illustrations that reflect the classical elements, earth, air, fire, and water. I'll get into some of the details in the actual brief for this project. For our second project, we are again going to be using traditional media to take a existing fairy tale or children's story and adapting it in some way for a modern audience. Here, for example, was a mixed media illustration created for an adapted version of Little Red Riding Hood. As you see, our first two projects are using traditional media. And the reason for that is that I think it is important to be familiar with traditional media tools. Because as we move over to the digital realm for our final two projects, a lot of what we are going to be doing is adapting some of the properties of traditional media, especially when we're talking about digital painting. The first of our digital projects is going to be using Adobe Illustrator, creating what I call an everyday monster. Here, Crystal has taken the idea of allergies and turned that into a monster. This was created using the tools within Illustrator, including custom brushes and some other unique Illustrator tools. Finally, we'll end doing a digital painting. I like to do my digital painting in Adobe Photoshop. However, if you want to do your digital portrait in a program like Procreate, that's fine. Those are the four projects of this course, two traditional media and two with digital media. As an introduction to this course, though, I would like to talk a little bit more about illustration. What is illustration? And more importantly, why would you use it? For illustrators out there, you may already know what illustration is and why you would use it. But for graphic designers generally, that might not be the case. Well, most broadly, illustration is image making. Originally, illustration was just any image meant to accompany a text. Illustration served a narrative function to basically explain what was happening in the text. Today, illustrators are creating the looks and production design for all sorts of animated features and video games. I have many students who are working in these fields, applying their illustration techniques. Let's take a look at this more deeply. Some of you may have heard of this idea before, the picture superiority effect. People will recall the information better after 24 hours if that information is accompanied with some sort of image. For example, this bit of information here is made more easy to recall just by the application of the donut graphs. Or look at this bit of complex information. This is an infographic about the largest bankruptcies in history. By clever use of the visual metaphor of a sinking ship, so much information is conveyed so quickly, we get the idea of the size and type of ocean vehicle representing the relative differences in these different companies. When presented like this, that information is compelling and memorable through the clever use of illustration. Let's talk briefly about image complexity or what we might even describe as style. I like to think of imagery as existing on a continuum, a continuum of information, from less information on one side to more information on the other. Here I have those ideas represented by a pictogram on the left and a photograph on the right. Each of these has its own application. The pictogram could be any dog. So it is a graphic that might be appropriate for a sign in a dog park, for example. 
whereas the image on the right, with its detailed information of a happy-looking dog with a healthy coat, could be the photograph on the front of a package of dog food. This isn't just any dog. This is this particular dog. But illustration doesn't fit easily in this way of looking at imagery. Illustration brings in something completely different. Suddenly, the illustration brings in a different property of stylization, which isn't a quantity like information that can be measured. It's more of a quality, a uniqueness that a simple pictogram or even a photograph do not have. This is the real value of working with illustration. And as an illustrator, you want to be working in this area where the unique qualities of illustration are highlighted. We'll talk more about this in just a moment. Let's take a look at some illustrations as examples of what we're talking about in terms of visual information and stylization. There's a style of illustration that I like to do, as you can see from this example of a children's book I've illustrated. There's a lot of visual information that's going on in a piece like this. I call it pictorial, where the prime objective is to get across a complete visual space, complete with light, shadow, and atmosphere. This is something illustrators do quite a lot of still. In fact, they may use 3D programs a little bit more, but I didn't use a 3D program for this. I actually just used Illustrator primarily and finished it up in Photoshop. But let's take a look at another example of an illustration. Now this is a different take on form. This is Brad Holland. Brad Holland is one of the most celebrated editorial illustrators of all time. What makes Brad Holland's work so unique is his conceptual storytelling. This illustration, for example, accompanied an article about scientists and their work being silenced by government. While staying fairly realistic in the sense of keeping a consistent light source and shadows falling consistently upon the objects within, Brad is illustrating the power and balance between the two subjects of the story using a surreal relationship of scale. This is a beautiful visual metaphor, something that Brad Holland is really known for. Let's take a look at some more. Here is a surrealistic piece by Nicholas Castell. I'm not actually sure what the application for this was, but it does highlight something very interesting about visual imagery and illustration in particular. There are things that only illustrations can do. That is where I believe that you need to be working. If the imagery that you're working on can better be said through application of a photograph, then you're not using the full capabilities of illustration. Let's take a look at another example. Rudy Gutierrez works in a very particular way. I call this expressionistic. What I love about Rudy Gutierrez's work is that we see the contrast between the highly expressive brushwork and the crudely drawn figures versus the highly rendered faces and details that suggest a master's hand. Rudy Gutierrez is half Velasquez, half Basquiat. Another illustrator who I feel works really well in this expressionistic vein is Martin French. Martin French, again, like Gutierrez before him, contrasts the expressive style with some impeccably drawn and rendered elements. I love artists who can walk that path between highly rendered and expressive. But here is a different take on the expressive. Andrea Dechino illustrated this famous children's book. I love the confidence that's expressed through that brushwork. That is a confidence that comes from lots of work. The rest of this book is equally as stunning. Let's take a look at some other ways of working. Here's an early example of what I call the conceptual composite. This is, in fact, one of the very first photo collages ever created by Raoul Hausmann in 1919. There's something about the composite that has the air of conceptuality about it. Let's take a look at a modern example. Matthew Richardson is a British illustrator. Here is an illustration accompanying an article in a science magazine that asks the question, why our brains are so big. In the article, it suggests it's because we needed to be able to conceive of movement through uncertain environments in 360 degrees. You can see how Matthew Richardson has suggested those ideas, movement and conceptual development, using old vintage photographs and illustrations. In simple color blocking, Matthew Richardson has achieved something really interesting. It doesn't require necessarily a deft hand at drawing. This is something any visual thinker can achieve. Here's another example. Amy Gwip is a photographer and graphic designer. I definitely suggest you look up some of her current work online, but here is a wonderful example of some of her early photo collage work. Here is Agatha Dudek's wonderful illustrations. You can see how she's using some found photography and some clever masking to make it look like a collage, and then some digital tools to create some really interesting pieces. Nate Williams is famous for his idiosyncratic drawing style. 
using a lot of very simplified patterns and almost a folk art type application to create his fanciful illustrations. Here's a couple of other examples, though, of illustrators using a very unique drawing style to their advantage. David Hughes here is using a very spontaneous line and a wild sense of humor to get his idea across. Ola Volo is a Vancouver-based artist who specializes in large murals. Another example of a naive and idiosyncratic style. This illustration here by Mark Hoffman has the energy of a nervous tick, but this is perfect for certain applications. Something else you see a lot these days is this flat geometric drawing style. One of the reasons you see this a lot is that it is perfect for applying to the medium of animation. In my animation class, we do something similar to this, where we create some graphic icons and then animate those. Something about these flat graphics and geometry makes them really compelling. The short takeaway from this presentation is that, as illustrators, we have a wide variety of styles that we can go to. However, the success of any illustration is determined not just by the style, but how well it communicates. Because, remember, illustration is art with a job to do.